Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. I'm Georgia Christa, Tax Event Coordinator, and it's a great it's a great pleasure to introduce George Lawson and his invites to present Craftsmanship in the Cotswold. This talk and discussion with George invites will present an amazing project that have been I've been personally following on Instagram for a few years already finding it always fascinating and wanting to know more on how this project started and developed over the time. The project is a combination of conservation and new build works to a grade one listed manor house and is the perfect example that if you have a vision, determination, and of course a generous budget, you can achieve an extraordinary standard of quality of works if you know how to put together a team of super craftsmen. Because those fantastic craftsmen still exist, you only have to know where to look for them. Most of the time, they are training conservation projects or they belong to a long chain of craftsmen in the family having the crafts in their blood. But what I would like to emphasize about this project is that the architects should trust their craftsmen, consider them their partners in the creative process and also learn from them. An excellent and experienced craftsman is a priceless source of knowledge, embedding several generations of trials and successful experiments in order to perfect their craft. Their knowledge is in itself a piece of intangible heritage, and it should be in our duty as architects to keep their crafts alive by designing beautiful projects incorporating traditional building techniques and details. And now I will introduce you George Lawson, who's a RICS Charter Project Management Surveyor. He specializes in working for private clients undertaking major construction projects to country houses. Much of George's works has been focused on work on historical country houses and their estate, as he is passionate about the preservation of historic buildings and using the right materials and techniques required to conserve them. And now I would like to hand over to George and uh, I will be back after the talk with a session of questions and answers. If you have questions during the talk, please type them on the message bar at the bottom of the screen. And then after the talk, I will invite you to unmute your microphone and ask directly your questions. George, the floor is yours now. Yeah, no, thank you, Georgia. I think the first thing to say is, very, we're very, very lucky to work on this incredible project. And, you know, we are, it's a very collaborative effort and it's, it's, we are a small part of the wider team. So I think that's, that's the first thing to say, but I think, you know, I have been involved in this amazing project for the last 12 years now, um, working on it pretty much nearly full time in those 12 years. So it's been an incredible experience and it's, you know, our amazing clients really, we've got to thank that, um, you know, have the passion and drive to, you know, to work to, to embark on a project like this and, and to you know finish it has been a, incredible so here we go so oh there we go yeah fine so do i just show you where ickham is so it, it's northwest of oxford about an hour away in the north cotswolds um in the beautiful part of the world um just thought i'd show you some drone photos of the of the house and the kind of wider estates so here is Ickham in the middle. We can see it's amazing. We've got a scaffolding drawbridge over the moats that we've recently discovered. Um, the, we're doing a, a phase, the house is now complete, but we're doing a wider phase of landscaping around it today. And that's probably got another two years of, of, of work left. On the right, you can see the arch and, and the courtyard. And that was the kind of years one to five, we were constructing that. Um, the kind of a view from the east again showing the moat and, and the, the house the, it's um yeah the north range and then we've got the the, the, the um hall and the view from the south i will just show you some kind of floor plans so these are kind of the floor plans of, of the house with the great hall sitting in the middle and then we've got the north range and, and the north and south courtyards and i thought this is a it is a great section showing a good kind of Set of the house as it's completed with the solar strap work plaster work up here and the, the kitchen extension on the left. So why is it um, grade one listed? Well, it's it's mainly due to its age. It, it's 600 years old. We we know that because of um, we've had some good dendro technology from the original roof um, structure. So here on the left, you can see the, the medieval Great Hall. And on the right here is the, is the North Range. And, 
that really is, you know, it, it dates from 1420. Uh, we, we think that this guy, Richard Winchcombe, who um, John Goodall brilliantly found as, a, as, the, as, the, as, the, as, the, as the master mason and original architect in the 15th century. And his client was this person called, uh, 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 it's, it's gone, it, uh, it's, um, yeah. And uh, 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 he was a knight of King Henry V and he um, fought at Agincourt and um, yeah. John so John, Black. there you yeah. go, there you go, man, thanks. Um, so this, I thought this is a good photo. This is our earliest photo of Wickham. So this shows um, the house in about 1890. Um, it shows the original doors, which are quite interesting, which we'll talk about earlier, um, later on in, in the talk. But it, showed, it was a very dilapidated state in about eight, 1890. And then we've actually had some dendrochronology on these doors as well. And, and that ties back in with the 1420 date. So these, do these do remaining pieces of doors are very significant and very special. Um, the next photo we have is jumps ahead about 50 years after the Victorian restoration. So it shows in a bit restored state with the sheet glazing. And then we jump ahead again to the 1970s, where again, it's, it's kind of hasn't been loved too much, but it's it, it, it's OK. And then this is the picture of 2010 when our clients bought the property. So it, it was in a pretty... Um, poor state of repair. The roof was leaking. A lot of the internal... Um, rooms were not in great condition but yeah it, it was it was livable um the rooms were quite plain um quite, not very decorative a lot of the fireplaces have been removed in the victorian refurbishment works and you can see on the bottom right hand corner they just um, put in these concrete surrounds which is very disappointing and a lot of the plaster work was um gypsum and cement there's lots of damp problems the, the, there was like a, a, a asbestos everywhere it wasn't it wasn't in great condition and um, these are kind of more photos of when it was um, in its original condition when the client bought it. So the, the great hall on the right and the solar with the barrel vaulted ceiling on the left. So I just thought I'd share some of the client's brief to give it a bit of context. So I think it took a bit of time to get there, but we, it was the client's brief was to achieve the highest quality. Um, cost and program really came second and third. The clients were very keen to use a specialist craftsman to help them design and implement all of this amazing work that we're about to talk to you about. So there weren't, we didn't have a main contracting team for the majority of it. So it was a very small team of, of construction. So it was, it was Philip and, and Ben and, and others, but it wasn't, we didn't have a huge team of main contractors there to, um, to talk through things. So which I think really simplified and really got to the point of what we're trying to achieve in terms of design and specification. So I'll just talk about a few of the kind of existing issues of what we found when we, um, started the project. So there was a lot of cement pointing, a lot of the stonework was in the poor state of repair. A lot of the windows had this cement um, smearing all, all over the windows, which we only found out once we cleaned the building. Um, so the first thing we did is we were very lucky to, um, I, my old office in Sciences did was, um, to, you know, right next door to where Rory Young used to live. And I was, used to bump into him every so every now and often. And I, he was very lucky to have him involved and help me develop all the mortars and the render specifications at the beginning of the project. And that was a really kind of big thing to do and really um, helped us evolve and develop all the mortar specifications and, and producing all these um, uh, large um, sample panels really helped that. And then we also went down to um, the building limes forum in Canterbury and met with Nigel Copsey and we was really looking at hot lime mortars and non-hydraulic limes. And that was a really good kind of learning curve and, and helped us really develop the specifications. We, our client was also well-resourced and took a holistic approach to the building project. And I think that was quite unique with a lot of the other projects I deal with is the clients you know, don't usually have that holistic view. So, I think the scaffolding was really a prime example of that. So that enabled us to cover the whole building, control the environment, and um, really implement the phase of, of restoration and refurbishment works. So this is probably one of my favorite photographs of Vickham is when we had the, the whole roof taken off and exposed all of the roof. And it was um, this was prior to doing any of the, the timber work um, repairs, but it just shows the holistic nature of our work and we did. And then we then, following this, we then, completed the timber work repairs and then holistically insulated the, the roof and then re-roofed it with um, reclaimed Cotswold stone slates. Um, so I just thought I'd show you photos of um, some of the timber work repairs that we implemented. And on the right is the, the new screen that I'll show you another photo of in a minute, but it just shows 
the wood, the roof wasn't in actually that bad condition. And I think the top left photograph shows one of the worst repairs we actually found, which was a, kind of a rotten end um, A-frame beam. So some of the stone repairs were quite significant. This was one of the more significant ones in the Great Hall. So we, we conservatively re replaced stonework and we were very hesitant to remove any of the historic stonework, but where we needed to, we replaced um, some of the stonework. But this was one of the more major interventions we did. Um, so th this is the some of the we then uh, this is the north crenellation. So we we took the, took this apart and we um, then used stainless steel cramps to build it all back together again. But we only replaced minimally the, the stonework where we absolutely had to. We really were keen to to retain as much as possible. And here's a great photo of Anna finally lime washing the the, the crenellations and Dom, who was a long term stone conservation mason on the project. Um, so Philip Scorer is a good person to talk about. So he, he runs a company called Vitruvius Conservation, Conservation, and he was our stone conservation um, kind of lead. And he, him and his team probably spent four years on the project, repointing conservation stone repairs, and you know looked at the total building and repaired it totally. And a lot of the work was chimneys as well. And he, you know, that was a great big part of the project. Um, another major kind of repair we did with the stonework was this um, window in the north range where the stone sill had been damaged. So we replaced it. And this is it at the end. So kind of with Philip's amazing render on with the um, new glazing. Um, and I thought, so I'll just show a, a sequence of the, the repointing. So I think a big thing to talk about is w w because the project was so big, Philip and his team, they took what Rory had initially done with the sample panels and they developed it and they managed it. And we, because it was, we were using mortar in so many different conditions on, on the building from, from the tops of chimneys to general backing out to pointing, you know, Philip was so really good in developing and, you know, adapting the lime mortars and, and working you know, within different environments to, um, to, to make them all the pointing really perfect, really. Um, so another sequence showing the cleaning. So we steam cleaned the building first, but then we raked it out. Philip and his team repointed. And then I've got a video in a minute of um, the rendering. And then it shows Philip then lime washing the building at the end. Um, yeah, I'll see if this video works. So this is showing the, the harling process that Philip and his, his um, colleague Rob um, and his team kind of undertook. And this was a, a big part of the project was getting the right texture and the right um, kind of finish really and it just shows you kind of the flicking technique to be able to apply the the, the render so it's 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 um stuck well and um yeah um we were very lucky to have the spab um scholars come around and that was a kind of a, a good project wasn't it philip just kind of embarking some knowledge and they're kind of kind of giving you know telling them kind of our, our story and, and the different kind of problems we've encountered and that was a you know good part of that um and then this is the building as it, when we finished. So it shows the rendering and then the new roof and the new lead work and all the new glazing. And, and you can see the, um, I talk a minute about the new cellar we built, but that, that was in, in the back here. Um, and then this is the North Courtyard at the end, showing Philip's amazing um, rendering and the new um, glazing and the stone conservation repair and all the new guttering as well. And um, Ben and Ben Sinclair from Norgrove Studios did all the um, the leaded lights, and he 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 created these stained glass heraldic shield showing the six major past owners of, of um Ickham, which we thought was quite um good. And it's one of Ben Ben Nader's amazing doors here. And um, yeah, this is the North Range at the end. Um, you can see here we discovered our moat and we're investigating. So that this is probably done about three. It's a picture from three years ago. So we, we think there's a, a moat here, which I'll talk about in a bit more in a minute. Um, and then I just thought I'd show some before and afters. So this is before, and then we've got the after, and then we've got the, um, yeah. So the work was extensive, high quality. We were very lucky to use Philip and, and our stone conservation masons and, and take that holistic repair approach to the whole building and have the time to be able to implement it. I think that was a really big um, part of it, really. Another kind of before and after showing it. And then this is the great hall wall. So Ben, I think we'll talk about this door in a bit more detail, but this is one of our kind of best th things we've done on the project is um, what this, this amazing new um, door that, that Ben will talk about later on in the project, but it's a, it's a bit of a thing, that one. Bit of good fun. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, the moat, so we, we've discovered a moat putting services in into the um, North Range. And um, 
so what we're trying to do is um, it's a phased approach. So we have to apply for this to build a consent to implement it. So we're actually doing that at the moment. And this is a recent um, drone photograph showing the kind of semi-excavations of the moat. Um, we don't think the moat went around the building and was just, we think the moat was just focused on the north range and was a channel across it. And maybe, you know, Sir John Blackett in the 15th century were in France, you know, looking at castles, thought, you know, I want a moat and implemented it then. But it, you know, so we're in the process of trying to um, get permission to put this in. But it was an incredible project in, in, in discovering it. And, um, you know, we found a bastion, we think here, we found, we think we found um, some of the remnants of the old drawbridge um, with the old timber work. Um, and it was, we've done a big phase of um, archeology span to investigate it. And um, some of the finds we found, we found one, I think one of the largest collection of um, leather ever found. And because of the um, anaerobic conditions of the moat, all of the um, organic um, items we found were really well preserved, which was quite unique. And some of the timbers, this is one of the timbers here, which we think is from the old jaw bridge, which is quite interesting. And then uh, we think we found a whole, a, a lot of these quarry tiles, which again, we think are from Hales Abbey, which are either imported after the um, dissolution of the monasteries or, you know, part of the history. And then some of these coins in this onion bottle. So yeah, it, it's been a really interesting um, finds. So I think one of the projects I'm actually trying to implement at the moment is, is researching and trying to implement, um, have enough um, research to be able to apply for um, a new drawbridge to go into this north range. Um, you can see here with these um, historic, there's a big swept stone that's missing, but you can see the kind of the outline of one here, and then that would then fall down onto this new stone bastion. So we're, we're trying to implement and, and um, get permission to put this in. And this is a great drawing from John Goodall who from country life. He's trying to help us. And he's the kind of the go-to expert on medieval castles. And then this is kind of, I think Ben will talk a bit about this later, but Ben's done some great sketches and some concepts to look at, you know, how that would work with the jaw bridge. And, um, but we'll talk about that. Um, I think the other big part of the project was um, putting this amazing cellar in. So this enabled us to put all of the mechanical and electrical services away from the historic part of the house into this new cellar. So, and we also, part of that was also having this um, incredible wine cellar with the vault of brickwork, which was um, a good project to implement. But there was kind of a bit of a, um, a bit big hole and um, yeah. Uh, just, just talking about some of the stone fireplaces. So we put in a, a collection, I think it was 12 fireplaces. And I just thought it'd be quite interesting to show the design process. So we'd start off with a sketch, um, the modeler would then model it in clay. Um, and then if, if needed, they would then do a plaster on Paris cast. Um, that would then go to the stonemason. So we use this really um, incredible stonemason called Wolfstone. And their, um, you know, their team of banker masons are, um, were really um, incredible that produced it, carving out these fireplaces. And this is probably one of the most kind of freehand um, ones that they produced, um, which, was, which was great. And um, this is us in, um, fitting them. And this um, kind of a good mention goes to John Wilson. So he, he was a stone conservation, he is a stone conservation mason. And he's probably been involved in the project for five years, continually doing um, fitting fireplaces, repointing, stone conservation repairs. And he's been one, and he did all the moat stone work repairs as well. So he's been a great person to have on the project. Um, and then with Rob Fleming, and then this is one of the major fireplaces. Um, so I'll just skip through a bit. I've just gone on a bit. So. The other big part of the project was implementing all this amazing joinery. So um, that's a staircase, which was is pretty incredible. Um, and then the other kind of um, significant piece of joinery was um, this medieval screen that was sitting in the Great Hall. So here you can see on the left um, the, the kind of what it looked like before. So it was a bit of a couple together. And then here we have um, the architect, the architects kind of planning drawing. And then John Nethercote's team, John produced this kind of up to date architectural sketch, a refining the portion of proportionality. And then his team then implemented it. And this is Damien and Keith making it in, in, um, in, in, in Wales. And, and that's in, one of the most incredible things I've ever been involved in is to be you know, lucky enough to for, be able to manage, manage a project, you know, building this and, and um, fitting this medieval screen. And this is, a, this is it at the end. So this is the new fireplace on the right with Ben's amazing door kind of grinning through this new amazing architectural screen that kind of fits in better with the 15th century hall. And, um, you know, we, we pointed all the external walls, there's new flagstones on the floor heating. Ben, uh, Philip's um, team did all the plaster work, didn't you, Philip? It was Anna um, did all the plaster work up here. And then we've got the new glazing. So it's all, it's all been touched. It's all been had work to it. And then just quickly talking about the solar. So this is the room before we started work. 
Um, this was the architect's planning drawing showing the panelling and, and the um, and the plaster work. And then again, John Nethercote's um, beautiful sketch of, of the panelling. Joe, his son, um, starting to carve it with the with the with the architectural um, chimney piece, and then the, delivering the chimney piece. And and it was but John used Stokesy Castle as his design inspiration with the caryatids, which is um pretty. They were you know immensely detailed and and you know. He, John's team are skilled craftsmen, and, and but John took the planning drawings and really refined them and did and worked out all the detailing. Because you know all the mouldings, all of the proportionality. John managed to you know stood with the clients and described his dream, and and and, and the client basically said yes, go ahead. So John had basically had carte blanche to all the mouldings, all the detailing. You know that was John never good, but it was um inspired by um you know the architects and working with them so it was really you know, that kind of shows the collaborative team effort to get to this amazing um kind of end results here and that this is the solo at the end with ben's amazing elm floorboards um which was a, a project in itself and the, the paneling and the um the, the phillips plaster work and then just finally just touching some of the um the um decorative scheme so as the peoples with working with melissa white implemented um these um, kind of decorative schemes of the forest. And then he, we did this room upstairs in the North Range where we um, looked at the design inspiration of a, a house called Haddon Hall in Yorkshire and um, produced this amazing um, shield and, and checkerboard scheme. And that that's it really, that's my um, introduction to the project really. Philip, over to you. Well, thank you very much, George, and, and well done for that. It was It was fascinating, even from at the point of view of somebody that's been involved in the project for the last six, six or seven years or so, I, I yeah. found that fascinating. I think longer. I'm, I'm because I, I met you, Philip, on a. I went to a World Monuments Forum lecture on historic plasterwork in 2015, so nine years ago. And when, I, when we're looking at options and reviewing it and, and looking at different kind of. Gosh, I'm older than I, I'm older than I thought. Yeah. Um, well, good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us. Um, Every, every now and then the telephone will ring or we'll get an email through the through the computer. And um, I think it was an email that I first saw from George and I read it and uh, instantly knew this was going to be a special project for us. Um, because we were talking about a, a brand new Elizabethan style ceiling. They don't happen very often, of course, uh, although a little more often now we've started the ball rolling. Um, it, it's a particular interest of mine, early British plaster work. And uh, I, don't, I don't want to uh, sound too commercial, but I've recently published a book on the subject. So if anybody's anybody's interested in that, uh, please visit our website and uh, and you'll find it there. So the work at Ickham, um, we did the Harling, as George said, the very first part of the work that we did there. And that was that was fabulous to to give the house a, a protective coating on the outside. Um, but I'm going to talk to you about the work we did inside tonight and starting with really the evolution of plaster work, plaster ceilings. When we think about plaster ceilings, um, if we consider the age of plaster ceilings in the, in Great Britain. Actually, they haven't been around for that long. And the image that George showed of the medieval, the great medieval hall earlier was 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 a fabulous example of why. Um, up in, in, in 1420, when the great hall was built, um, the fire would have been on the ground in the middle of the room and the smoke would have had to drift up into the roof space yeah, well, we've actually when we had the scaffolding at high level, we actually found that, that all the all the great all the timbers at high level are all um kind of um, they've all singed, they've got charred yeah. from yeah. the timbers. Ex exactly, and and we could see from that image that the they they built a flue into the design of the roof, just a simple square opening, and so of course you couldn't have a ceiling, and actually the word ceiling itself comes from ceiling off the top of the room. So around about the second half of the 15th century, um, the domestic fireplace uh, became very popular and started to be installed, um, meaning that the room could be sealed, uh, not spelt seal as we spell sealing today. But the first image that should be on your screens now is a, is a beautiful example of that evolution. 
So we have a very early timber framed uh, medieval hall onto which somebody has slapped a great big brick gable in, in the probably the 15th or 16th, it's, it's probably 16th century, I would guess, um, with a chimney and a, and a fireplace inside. So at that point, the, the it was possible to put up plasters, well, to put up ceilings, I should say, not plaster ceilings, because the first ceilings were largely timber, um, often had lead, uh, cast lead direct decoration um, pinned to them. And the word strap work itself comes from the use of leather straps, uh, which were nailed to the ceilings to give them some decorative elements. So it wasn't until 1480 that the first recorded use of plaster on a ceiling is 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 recorded. Um, and it's just for filling in the flat areas between the timber carved beams. Um, and that's what we can see here is, is a very simple geometric use of, of uh, plaster work. The, the small beams are probably timber in this one, painted white. And of course, the large beams are timber. It's all right, now flick on to the next yeah, one. Yeah. Um, so we can see the beginning of plaster in this period is the, is the use of simple geometric plain ribs um, of varying degrees of quality and precision. And it's I, I actually really like the imprecision of plaster work from this period. It looks beautiful, but it's, uh, it's not perfect. Yeah. Uh, next slide, please. So we see simple drawings, uh, designs coming from uh, people like Serlio was producing books and the, and the designs were being used from those. And similar designs to garden um, patterns were being used for geometric uh, plaster ceilings. And so by the time we get into the 16th century, so the early 1500s, we start to see ceilings like this uh, popping up. This one's at Plasmauer in Wales, I believe, George, isn't it? It is, and Ben's actually got a slide showing when his his whole team visited Plasmauer to... Um, oh, I was there on Tuesday. <laughs> oh, were you? Were yeah. You? But this, this was, from the client's perspective, this is, you know, when we were showing them design inspiration images for the soda, this is kind of what caught their eye. We're like, this is what we want to try and recreate. Hmm. So. so, yes, this that was the inspiration yeah. for the solar ceiling, which was the barrel vault ceiling. But, but before but before I met Philip, I had my knowledge level was quite low, and we were actually looking at looking potentially at buying um, pre-made, pre-cast pieces of plaster and sticking them to the ceiling. So it was only when we were actually kind of researching, actually, how do we do this authentically? How do we make it look like it's always been there? How do we do this? How they would have done it in the fifteenth century? Was then so, you know, researching and then found Philip's lecture and in, in the World's Monument Forum, and then going to see him and listen to him. I was like, wow, we need to involve Philip. He's the expert, and that's kind of how the journey. Begun. Thank you. Um, so the beautiful imprecision. I love this little shield in the in the in the center of that square. Um, the way that it's it's completely not geometric. Um, it, it sort of um, is a nice illustration of how ungeometric things can be, but but still very charming. Um, next slide, George. And 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 similarly here, um, you know, it, it's all a little bit off but I, I i think that's really beautiful um next slide and here as well sorry the slide hasn't uh, uh can we go back one george please yeah, that, one. that slide's far from perfect but if what we can see at the very top is the tip of a fleur-de-lis uh matching the 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 two on the side uh either side uh and look how off center that fleur-de-lis is yeah it's wild <laughs> but i love it all the more for that. Um, they were making very simple figurative uh, cast, or not cast, well, they were casting some things, but these are hand modeled. The material that they were using is key to the process. Uh, it's, a, it's a mixture of lime and stone and chalk and lots and lots of hair. And it, it actually takes on the characteristics of clay. So you can manipulate it in your hands to make it uh, make it in any shape and then press it into place like you would a piece of clay. It's, it's wonderfully, um, you can manipulate it beautifully. So there are three different styles of plaster ceiling. There's plain rib, 
which we can see here. The next yep. slide, George, please. There are uh, enriched ribs here. The, you can see that the design is evolving from that first plane rib. And then the next one. Like Blickling Hall or something, Philip. Is it someone similar? Blickling Hall, is this a photo of? It looks very no, similar. this is Apethorpe. Apethorpe, okay. Car carried out by the same plaster as, at Blick as Blickling, uh, James Lee. Is it James Lee? Oh, no, Edward Stanion. Edward okay. Stanion. Claire, uh, Claire would kill me if I said it was uh, not not Edward Stanley. Um, this is Claire Gapper, Dr. Claire Gapper. She's the leading uh, historic expert in the world um, on plasterwork of this period. And she, uh, she had a fantastic website, doesn't she? Her website yeah. is incredible. It's like it's like the go-to library of um, British um, early plasterwork, isn't it? It's, it's yeah. incredible. The, the website is a, a national treasure. Um, Claire has spent her whole life researching plaster work from this these these periods, and her husband photographed them. So they they've created this huge volume of information about plaster work from that period. This is Apethorpe per palace. So how were the ribs constructed? We can see on this image here three coats. It's a three coat process. Uh, a first coat laid onto the laths, a core, and then a top coat to uh, to finish off. Next slide, George. So here we have a picture of the solar before. We can see some staining on the on, on the ribs, the timber ribs. Yeah. Um, and all we had was anecdotal history. We had no hard evidence there was ever plasterwork on it. There was only that evidence that we had, wasn't it? So we can see that it was once plastered, but we don't know what the design was. No, exactly. Um, so the ceiling was larved with the uh, riven oak larving. Yeah. And then the pattern... We drew, we drew onto the ceiling with lime wash, so yeah. we set it out with strings um, and nothing more, yeah. and then lime wash the pattern. And then we made these tools to start forming the mouldings, and we formed the mouldings first. So, yeah, I, I had this one in, Philip. But this is a good photo oh. showing you actually running it in, in, in situ. I thought it was, gr it was yeah. great. Yeah, so we, we basically built the plaster work up in two coats over two days. Um, and it was a Singleton and Birch's fibre lime that we used for this one. Uh, very simple, very handmade, no, no no rules, no guides, just the lime wash uh, pattern. Um, and you can see Anna Castilla Vila, who worked with us, uh, forming some of the small rosettes on the left hand side there. Next slide, George, please. And there it is finished. Um, so we worked on this ceiling with, uh, there was myself, my eldest son, Will, my youngest son, Jude, and then Anna as well. Anna did most of the sort of boss work in the centres. And my son, Will, and Jude did the rosettes and uh, some of the ribs. Well, um, well, I hope she won't mind. She's very understated. And, you know, she's an incredible craftsman in her own right, isn't she? You know, she's uh, and, really yes, absolutely. That's it's something that we love about the work we do is bringing in people that that bring their skills to us as well um so yeah so it the undulations that you can see wouldn't be seen under normal light and certainly not under 16th century light um but this is highly lit by strip lights uh leds yeah. on top of the cornice isn't it so this is the solar the cornice was run by hand yeah. um sorry the rosettes uh, yeah. So the rosettes we made a reverse plaster mold and then would press the lime and chalk into the mold peel it out straight away while it's still wet and then press it onto the ceiling which was also wet so there's a complete bond there's no adhesives available at this time so um you had to use wet on wet technology so this is a, a spoon i found in transylvania that i made into a small tool which is invaluable one of my favorites this is the the, the 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 bay window off the solar. Um, the client sent us a, a, a photograph of the bay bay window at Sizer Castle in Cumbria, Big which, uh, which is that one. Um, and the the goal was to co copy that. So we used a different material this time. We used lime coat by Best of Lime, which enabled us to put on a whole coat over the ceiling first. Mark the pattern onto the ceiling and then start building it up while the first coat was still wet. This is Will, my eldest son, building up ribs. 
we've built the ribs first and you can see the grid network behind um that's that's something we found on existing ceilings original ceilings that grid pattern layout that helps you setting out it helps you so it's, yeah it's just a loose guide very yeah. simple loose guide um then we we started filling in the panels and hand modeled these little um uh, devices yeah. um that were similar to the ones at sizer all very hand modeled with the transylvanian spoon and then the client's um coat of arms in the center um yeah and that's that's the finished piece there you go. And it works very well with the stained glass and John Nethercott's work on the panelling. Yeah. Um, we'll just have a quick I do before and after. So that's a before. Oh, yeah, uh, lovely. After. So we have a quick look at the office and yeah. then let Ben yeah. have his time. Yeah. We'll and just the office ceiling um was a series of um beams that were on the ceiling, timber beams that were all uh, various shapes and sizes and depths. And the client asked us to cover them in plaster. And then model in uh, these grotesques uh, for the for the mitres. So we would model them up on a on a bench uh, by hand, just with our hands, and push them into place on the wet plaster, and then fine tune them in situ. But, but this is one of Rebecca's, wasn't it? I can't remember the yeah. Done by Rebecca it? Gilling, who was a visiting student of the Prince's Foundation, as it was. Yeah. Um, we engaged Quite with students nice. a lot. So there were some rude. Uh, grotesques as well asked for by the client but most of them were inspired by images we found in ecclesiastical buildings existing so we can't be blamed for the design of that previous image well, i think it's a good photo to end on because it's it is yeah. ben um he's going to speak next this is his paneling that he's um perfect. designed produced and installed so this is um, perfect over to you ben yeah and then this is my last photo sorry this is the last one showing it all on the end oh yeah mm -hmm. well, just quickly um Exodus one. Thought you did a very good job there, Philip, of, of managing to avoid too many of the offensive ones of those. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, where's he going with this? <laughs> <laughs> there are some bad ones, aren't there? There are some really bad ones. <laughs> well, we, uh, yeah. Sorry, um, right, right. So uh, I'll I'll try and do this justice. That I could I could talk about Ickham and and uh, and and our involvement in it for for hours. So you might have to just shut me up at some point. Um, it's been it's been really nice uh, listening to the you know how how you've talked about the collaboration behind yeah. the project and uh, and the key to this the success of this project has been everybody respecting everybody leaning on each other you know kind of working together for the for the for the common goal um, and and I, I couldn't I couldn't agree more George that that the person behind all of this really and, and who set the tone was Alex. Yes, absolutely. Um, even even just from meeting him the first time, um, quickly established that that most of the people that were in the meeting all have the same reference books, and I was just like, oh, fantastic! We finally, you know, you finally find someone who's on the same page as you, sort of thing. Um, so we, we've been uh, we've been involved in the project for probably about four years, um, which totals something along the lines of fifty different separate joinery elements of the project um from doors paneling floors uh cupboards some kitchen elements uh, and then currently as george mentioned before we're 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 in the process of working through the drawbridge uh project which is a, a, you don't you don't every day get asked if you can make a drawbridge which is you know everyone in the workshop's a bit like a kid in a sweet shop so that's nice um i think the th we we have a typical process that we try to work uh, through, uh, which follows a kind of a client meeting, uh, which which gets um, uh, clients and architects and project and whoever whoever's involved on that sort of design element. Um, we would get together, do a bit of fact finding, find out exactly what the brief is, what the what the if there's any specific requirements. Um, then we then we'd kind of go away and. Uh, produce some hand concept sketches which help you without putting a lot of time into something you can thrash out some ideas which gets you to that next little stage um the 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 off the back of that we'd also do samples so we could do quite a few physical samples um which again helps 
what what we do is a bit different. We're very traditional with how we or how we work. So conveying to the client um, why we're different and how we're different and what that translates to in in terms of of the finish. So the, 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 this photo is incredibly the, you know, because the, yeah. Alex the client saw doors like this and was yeah. like, "How do we get there?" So yeah. this is the journey we went on with Ben. Was you know we've got a planning drawing like that on the left. How do we get to the end yeah. product? Now this is why Ben has been incredible for the project is working out that journey and understanding you know, that process and implementing it. So. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's all the reason we do the hand sketches is because there's something quite uh, clinical and and, um, and and hard to interpret from a from a CAD drawing. Yeah, well, it's, 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 which is this. Yeah, so the next the next step from the sort of uh, getting all those details agreed is to then start looking at the at turning it into a CAD drawing. Now, there's there's multiple benefits uh, that we found having having this tool at our disposal, and we put quite a lot of time, effort, and and resources into our our design department in in the company. Um, well, so I think from, from my perspective, that's what stands you out from any other joiner I've ever met is the time you guys take to design it and work it out on paper before you actually start constructing, and it, it, it's incredible the detail you go into. You know, it's yeah. all. I mean, a, a part of that comes from be, we're very, very fussy. Like the, the yes. myself and myself and Rob and and everybody that's been with us for a long time, we're all very fussy with how we want things doing. So first, first and foremost, how do we convey that to our own work? Yeah. You're incredibly passionate, and, and you know, it's precision, isn't it? So it's again, yeah. passion and precision is equals you know this is. is... Yeah, it's it's very uh, it's very involved. It's like I say, I could talk about this for for hours, but. It's not just it's you know it's not just the timber it's not just the construction it's it's all of it and how it works together and that's what what this gives us the the capacity to do. Um, it also helps us to to fix to see problems and identify problems before we before we get to them in a physical world. Um, so I think the next one shows a few. Um, yeah, so there was a, this was a, this was a really nice example of collaboration because there was this tonic architects um who who were the architects on this on this project as well and well, this particular this particular door was a little bit of a late addition i think if i remember rightly yeah um, no, was, we couldn't get this to build a consent to implement it and it took I don't yeah. know, another year and a half to convince the historic and the planners to actually implement yeah. it and then we got permission so yeah yeah, and then and then quite quickly, once we'd surveyed it and gone through the 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 technical figuring out of this doorway, it became quite apparent that that a door that opened in a normal fashion on on normal hinges set close would would have uh, hit the 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 top of the the opening, and I think it was I think it was Tobias that mentioned sort yeah. of came up with the idea in a in a in a in a collaborative meeting on site oh why don't we try and crank the hinges so we went back we've we'd already modeled this doorway up we set these hinges up tested it animated in the in an, in our in our software um and then we then we could get the blacksmith to make the hinges from it which we knew was a safe way of doing it because we'd already tested the model we then mocked up this uh real world sort of um bits of stud work and, and ply uh with the hinges and check that it all worked it just meant that we could go through all those processes without having to go into uh, the complicated job of sort of or the, the expensive job of making something and then going oh that doesn't fit you know uh which is what we want to avoid really but um the the it it became quite apparent with ICAM uh, that our our typical way of working you know, or how we how we we usually like to work uh, would be challenged and in a good way. Um, depending on which job you look at within the project, we kind of approached it in different ways for each one, um, and it, it's good. Ultimately, we 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 enjoy solve, solving problems and um, and we enjoy working alongside people who are equally passionate. So this this set of doors, they they came to us, or the design came to us. This is the first set we did for for the project. It was almost like our 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 test testing out they were testing us out i think to see if we could uh cut the mustard um, <laughs> and the and the, the design was very advanced at this stage um we then took that design and we converted it into our card model we went down to bristol and sat with tonic architecture we tweaked it until it was exactly how they they envisaged it um 
from that point then what we what we had is we had a model that we could use for multiple reasons so the stonemasons who were doing the stonework around there they had the the capacity to deal with dxfs um so we we shared our dxf for the for the timber arch with the uh, with the stonemasons so they made the stone we made the timber and it just it just went together amazingly this was the sort of uh, the new build section of it, if you will, um, the the extension bit. Um, we can also send our, uh, our our model to, or we can we can design the ironmongery uh, at this stage as well, and um, and share it with our blacksmith, who then makes. Because again, it's expensive. It's expensive to do these things, so you want to get it right as from the start. Um, underpinning our. Um, underpinning our, our our technical side of the company is is what we actually started out as and that is a, a the foundation of us is is rooted in traditional techniques building our knowledge base up which has been a, a a steady process you know we've there isn't somewhere that you can generally go and learn this stuff we've 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 worked it out ourselves to this point from either speaking to old time joiners who do know a little bit or going doing doing uh, historical trips um but the underpinning of of what what we can offer is this this is our this is our mainstay um i think there's is there an yeah th so there is a video there i don't know if it's uh, oh, yeah. whether it'll work or not no it's not going to work it 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 doesn't like max i think you're on a mac okay, um, yeah. So, so we've, uh, you know, there's been an, a few elements on this job, metal work wise, um, where we've, it's been one of the, one of the elements that the clients uh, liked from us. So we could, we could provide sample drawings, we could get CAD, get them signed off, then we'd turn them into CAD drawings, and then we would approach our blacksmith and, and we were getting exactly what we needed for the, for the design that worked with our timber design side of things as well. Um there's also you had all those amazing historic pattern books showing all the examples. Yeah, so yeah which which actually those. leads into the, probably the next slide, I think. Yeah. Um, something that we've, uh, I, I can't imagine it's unique to us, but it's um, but it's something that we put a lot of store in, and that is research trips. So we will take the entire workshop out. You know, at a great expense uh, to 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 the company in in closing the whole workshop down for a day. Um, but we'll go out and round like um, we said before. This is actually plasma. Uh, you can see the ceiling in the in the top left there. Yeah. Um, and and we take we take dims. We we break break the 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 workshop into groups. We have team leaders who go around and 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 point out and highlight and and lead the discussion. But it's very much a discussion in these it, on when we're at these historic houses. Um, and it's amazing how no matter how many times you go somewhere, you'll always come away seeing something new. Always. I've, I've not had a trip where I've thought, yeah, I've seen it all. You know, you always see new stuff. Um, and, I, and I find that fascinating that, that there's just so much there. Plus, the benefit of this is you're looking at things that have survived. You're looking at things that have been made to last, that they've, that they've, they've been made in a way that actually you know, warrants repeating, warrants, warrants a bit of emulation. Um, yeah. So that's, that's been good. That, that, that also led us into this, which is the, the door that George mentioned before in the, in the courtyard. And this went through an entirely different process uh, with us because first of all, there was just a, there was just an existing opening. Um, and the client was like, I want something special there, but I don't know what. And so, that's where you know we we're we're happy to either lead uh, or be led depending on the situation and and in this project we've done both we've 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 sort of like followed a brief or we've suggested everything up front we don't mind um this was one of the this was one of the doors i said why don't we use this as the inspiration and and the client liked it that much he just wanted us to try and try and and recreate it i guess um so i went i went down to the site where that was and i did a full survey on it like measured every single little element now it, it didn't lend itself to being drawn in cad because no, it didn't see a machine there was all of those timbers were were uh, cut by hand everything was hand planed we had adzers on it there was no no reference points to use cad for so there was no benefit so we actually drew it out in full size on um 
on a sheet on some sheet material, uh, which helped us then develop the carving details on it, um, as well as Jamie going into going into full production on this. There's a, there's actually a, um, a a little yeah. So there's a it's a little it's probably a, a minute or so long, but this just goes to show the it's like a stop motion of the of the door going together itself. But what was what was quite fascinating about this is. Um, I think I'm right in saying that the that the doorway that we were copying was from approximately like 1420. Is that about right, George? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, so w interestingly, this this is actually on the other side of the country. I think it's in Kent, this church. Yes. And when I went to survey it, I didn't know this, but as I was surveying it, and then I came back and I started to put all of the the survey into a into our sort of um, our our Ickham survey. This the the original door was from fourteen twenty as well. The arch was the same, the width was the same, the height was the same. Everything tallied up like from the opposite side of the country. I don't know if there's anything in that, but um, it was interesting. Uh, it might have been that the architect's going to go on holiday in Kent or something. It could have very well been, yeah. So this is this is Bob. Uh, Bob's awesome. He's he's a uh, he's amazing. He's he's the metal work version of us, like. His ironwork, his his fire welding is is awesome. Now these are these are what are called roves, which is a medieval um, a fixing uh, used in timber work, and they they usually have what you can see there was the the diamond washer, the diamond back plate. That's on both sides, and then they're hot riveted on. So you'd you could see the flame come through as you door. We you rivet that on, uh, and then as it cools, you can hear it all creak and and pinch together and tighten up on the door. Uh, yeah, very enjoyable, very enjoyable day in the workshop that was. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's that's us fitting it. Now, that leads into I'm aware we're, we're getting a bit tight on time, but um, that leads into another another thing that the client was, you know, his 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 capacity and his appetite for for for, for playing around with stuff. I I found brilliant. I thought it was great. Um, and 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 everyone's patience in me coming up with ridiculous ideas, and then everyone going, yeah, all right. I mean, from George's point of view, a, a project manager, you know, having having the joiner turn around and go, right, and you know, those doors I've just fitted, I'm going to take them away for two and a half years now because because we've well, just fulfilling the client's vision. You know, it was incredibly exactly. important to have weathered doors, and it was you yeah. know, be terrible to fit a new door. And in a in a in a place where it wouldn't hit the weather and it looked new and that was yeah critical. So we, exactly we, yeah I mean it, the the majority of these doors that you can see were in the courtyard which was very protected very sheltered yeah. and and it might have took you know if if they went if they even went silver at all it would have took yeah. a hundred odd years so we just yeah. wanted to expedite that we took them up to our workshop once we'd fitted them. We built them into some shelters so they were set, so they were uh, protected, and then we just let the Peak District weather have at them. Um, and as you can see, I mean, it it does amazing things. Letting we don't put any finish on our doors on the outside. We always just construct them in a way that they will um, the weather the weatherproof from the construction side of things. But also that allows you to then get this silver silvery finish. I think there's another one, George. Yeah, there. So. I mean, it just—it looked great before when it was fresh, but it just, like, even even having been involved in making it and the weathering process, when you stand in front of it, it's kind of you get a bit giddy because it's it's just it's great, it's lovely. I mean, you don't get often get the chance to do uh, projects like that. Um, yeah, and then we've got the there was a, a room of paneling which was, uh, again very uh, it kind of it was a different process again the 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 bit there was quite a, it was quite a progressed a progressed uh design already that we got from the architects they'd done a lot of legwork they'd got a lot of the detail in they'd found a reference house that they wanted to use the the design of the paneling from which is actually uh, quite serendipitous it's charlton house so that's the same house that philip was lecturing on in 2015 when i went to his past work um, right right so so um our our lead uh, lead technical guy went who was in who was running this project the 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 paneling project he actually went down to Charlton House and uh, had a look round took his tape took some photos got got documented it as much as we could from a manufacturing point of view um and then he built he built a model that was 
Yeah. I mean, it was it was unreal, the actual CAD model for it. I think it had over, let me say, it had, it had over 5,000 components in the model itself, you know, uh, to just check the secret doors that moved and there was a, a fireplace in there and there was a window and there was a door. So we had a lot of parameters we had to hit. I think the room, uh, am I right in saying the room dropped six inches, Philip? The yeah, room? yeah. Yeah, the ceiling was all wonky, so we had to we had to work with Philip on picking our height, and and you know it was um, the the model was invaluable there. There was also an element of uh, so we got asked if we could do a coat of arms, which I'm, I won't lie, it concerns me sometimes because I think if you don't get these right, they can they can change an aesthetic of a room, and and you know it's really important that that it's that it's executed tastefully you know, in my opinion. <laughs> um, but so we worked, we worked up the, the, the client's uh, own actual fam, um, press uh, coat of arms into a, into what we knew would work as from a carving point of view. Um, and then we went through the whole process. This is sort of the mood board for into the, through into the model. We also were, we wanted to paint it, paint it up and, and as it would have uh, historically been But So we kind of painted it, distressed it back a little bit. Um, and then I think as you can I think in the next, yeah, so this was just, it's a little bit of fun in a way. Cause it, cause it was the client's own family, uh, coat of arms. We, we did him a box. It, it helped us get it to site, but we also did him a box just in case he ever left the pr property. I, I can't imagine he would, he might've wanted to take his own family thing with him. So it was just a packing case for him, you know, just a bit of, um, a bit of fun. And then seeing it, seeing it together. I mean, there's another couple showing the whole room. Uh, that's that's Rob. Despite his looks, that's our lead technical guy. So, <laughs> like the closest thing to the wild man of the West we've got. Um, so there's yeah. actually there's actually some secret doors in here as well. I probably shouldn't tell you where they are, but they were they were they were they're pretty secret. I think I don't know if you if you'd agree or not, George. But oh, um, yeah, you have to know where they are. You have to. You they're like spring weighted aren't they so you can pass yeah. the middle panel and then that that enables you yeah. to pull the to pull the door yeah they 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 good i mean this this is just that that last picture there that really shows the marriage between philips uh philips plaster work in the ceiling there uh the the stone fireplace is done by I can, sorry i can't remember the stone build and um, yeah Rob stone build, yeah yeah um and the floors that we've done as well i mean it's if you get that when a load of people work together and they've all care and they all you know it was that long that long term thinking because it, there was so much elm flooring the client had to buy it over a period of five years and we had to store it yeah. in containers on the site in dehumidified controlled containers so we had enough then to be able to then batch it up and sort it and then sort it into rooms and it was taking that you know a five year view but i think no i've never met, never met another client who had that yeah. passion and, you know I mean, um, I don't know. Uh, we've we've got some more if you want it, but I know we're we're getting up to time. I mean, that's just a, a selection of the doors that we've done there. You know, the bottom right hand one was made out of 16th century floorboards, so it's you, you can't particularly see it there. But if when you zoom in on that, it is it's nuts. You know, the timbers are absolutely perished. Um, this is a good one. This is your um, bespoke. Yeah. Name. So yeah. So just is there one more for, forward one? Yeah, that one. So I'll, I'll try to be brief. I could give you an hour on this alone, but um, I'll try and be brief. So this was this element of the project was quite close to Alex's heart because, as George said, he'd spent five years collecting uh, elm boards from around the country, old elm boards, historic elm boards. It was, I was going to the reclamation yards, so it was, you know, it was yeah. <laughs> so it was a team. It was a yeah, team. Absolutely. But, but the the just to just to clarify why that's even more impressive than doing it with say oak elm is very susceptible to 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 bugs and woodworm and and it doesn't it doesn't survive generally this this long just by the nature of it especially in the conditions it would have lived in so he had a lot of timber that was you know you could you could take it and you can either it can either look real after you finish with it or Oh, you can miss the mark, and it's like, and I know he didn't want to miss the mark. And after having spent a, a few years with us, uh, he he was he was kind of like, do you know what, guys? I you you I want you guys to do the do the job because I know I know you know what it should look like at the end of it. However, we'd kind of inherited this this part of the job off uh, off off um off off someone else, 
and and previous to us the 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 design that the flooring the fixing design that that had been floated was um was that it would be glued down on supply wood so th these boards range from 15 to 25 mil thick you know that's 10 mil 10 mil in difference um all of the services and everything had been set out for the job so we didn't have anywhere to go there was no there was no sort of um you couldn't put them through a machine because they were all warped and wobbly so we we managed to negotiate i think with uh with you um george that we could we could have another 10 millimeters uh of depth so we we fixed a load of oak battens glued onto the top of the ply and then we designed um a nail which is which is this one a barb nail so the the head of the nail when you've finished hammering it in looks like a we got a load of old nails and we looked at them and we looked which ones look best and we kind of picked it out so the top of the nail looks real but then underneath it's quite a it, it, you know we had 28 millimeters to get into below that it was you know it was like a snake's wedding there was just pipes and cables everywhere um so we couldn't hit that um and and the uh, adding the barbs these are all laser cut these nails um drawn in cad parametric so we can change them it's it, they've even they've even gone on to being used in other projects we're doing now off this off this problem solving uh, exercise but we this is one of the things that i think you know shows the level of um you know problem solving and detail you guys go into it's incredible you know it's you know, yeah there's not nails for historical authenticity and for you know making it actually work long term it's incredible yeah it's um i mean that's what yeah that's what that's the fun in life isn't it? Yeah. you know the kind of getting getting these challenges i mean this is showing the 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 drawbridge uh again we we've me and rob went down we had to survey this at night so that we could see our lasers properly so me and rob were bogging round in a in the bottom of a half filled up moat um <laughs> with wellies on for for an evening um this comes with its own complexities this this part of it because i think i'm right in saying english heritage I, like we know we can if you're going to do it it can't touch the building so we've got a we've had to come up with a a design and this is on live this job this is ongoing we're currently still working on it but um but yeah you can see in the picture on the left the the bottom the bottom of the drawbridge the sil the the silvery gray bits that's actually stone uh dressed stone that we're gonna we were gonna encapsulate into the design of the drawbridge and then you can see the pivot the pivot bar running through the middle the idea being that we could we could make a drawbridge that was operated by hand on a on a counterbalanced premise yep. that meant it didn't touch the building um so so that's that's we've i mean i think i looked at the i looked at the iterations of designs that we we did and floated with with the client and and yourself george i think there was 26 designs that rob had done yeah. uh just to show the you know the level of um of of yeah, yeah. well we did effort, something as well yeah, yeah. and, and then the yeah that's that's just showing it again a little bit of a we 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 the the, the client really liked the the linen fold design that we'd done we we actually pitched this for another part of the project um and and um and, and uh, the client was like oh not there but i want it there could you put it over here so then then it needed a handle and we just thought oh we'll we'll just you know work out how we can put a handle in without it looking funny and i've seen this kind of thing before in in historic um uh, references mm -hmm. uh, and then i think i think the last one this is this is a strange one because it's it's got ads ads legs and ads faces uh, it's very it's it needed to look um a certain way like a farmhouse country kitchen it was supposed to to tie in with the butcher's block at the end there as you can see but when you actually get inside that the the level of uh, engineering and the it's got it's got brass runners and bits of nylon runners inside it so it's very traditionally made there's no soft close draw runners there's no it's not a modern thing in its own right but but the 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 operation of the drawers and the it had all the services had to run through in an open in an open um island so we we had these brass pipes that the client found so we had to get bits engineered for them and then we had to build the sink in that was from a reclamation yard and we had pyrolave doing the worktops so it it had a lot of challenges in it um but again it's it's what makes it interesting isn't it so yeah i think uh i'm 
I don't think we left. I think that's we it. Went. Well, I'm amazed that we only went over by eight minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Both of that. Yeah. I think George has to talk more about other specialties because there are other teams involved Absolutely. in the project. Absolutely, yeah. but it went out of time. Yeah, it's been it's been a it's been a pleasure working on the on the project. Just you know, I work on lots of different sites, and they don't always have the you know we we're very lucky, but we don't always have the nicest vibe sometimes. And when you get somewhere where everybody gets on and and has the same objectives, it just makes it makes your day to day enjoyable. You know. Yeah, well, I think it's led by the client, isn't it, Ben? It's, it's the thing that he has that very clear vision and the culture of excellence, doesn't it? So it's 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 we all work together. We're all you know yeah. we all, if there's a problem, we collaboratively work together to find a solution. And it's you know very open and honest and transparent. And it's we just yeah. try and achieve the client's brief, which is pushing the boundaries and being unique, but achieving their dream. But you know, which yeah. we want to do every day, isn't it? Yeah, I, I couldn't encourage people to be collaborative more to be honest i think i think it's the key for me yes. uh, is the key to getting good results yes and no one knows one thing the most do they and it's, it's exactly. everyone talking together as everyone you know, has different yeah. project experiences don't they and that's really a key part of this you know wide ranging project it's, it's what some the big thing i've learned is you know talking to people and you know everyone's has all these different experiences that you can lean on it's it's, it's vital and key yeah Absolutely amazing presentation. Both of you, fantastic work. Thank you. George, can you tell you, us more about the other teams involved? Uh, A few no, words about the painting. Yeah, it's just, it's just, it's, it, yeah, I'd have to go through my slides again, but it's, it's all been. Oh, I see. Yeah, it's, it's so you all... covered practically this aspect as well. I think I have. It's, it's, fireplaces and it's fireplaces. It's wall handling. It's it's the painting which I've shown you. It's it's the kitchen extension which I didn't really do any photos of. And we did this amazing timber lodger that connected the kitchen extension, which was unique, pretty unique as well. But you know, there's there's so much, and it's it's um, you know, trying to condense it to an hour. It's, it's, it's I more... see. Yeah. And which part is practically new? Totally new. The kitchen extension so this is a kind of a photo showing it a bit of it if you turned around 180 degrees you'd see this amazing double height kitchen extension which unfortunately i don't have a photograph of but that that's um that's the new bit with the cellar and then everything else is you know 600 years old or you know uh, uh, sits within that i see so if somebody in the public has questions i think are you ready george to take some questions yeah absolutely absolutely if you have questions, please unmute yourself and ask the question directly. And I will start myself with a question about the fact that when you propose new features, um, what was the reaction of uh, planning officers? So, so the planning was a huge part of the project and took years. So uh, it, it maybe we submitted 10 different listed building applications and one major, one or two major ones. And the major one had maybe 10,000 documents in and took two years to prepare and the other year to negotiate. So it was, uh, it wasn't because the amount of change and work here was so much. It was, you know, doing, dealing with the planners and, and negotiating our way through that was very, you know, collaborative with them as well because the clients were very stubborn and well-resourced and we had a very good planning consultant. But it, it just took time. And, you know, we got there in the end, but it, you know, took 10 years. And I don't think other clients would have the you know, the stomach for that kind of journey. And, you know, the kind of, you know, it, it, frankly, money you have to throw at these things to be able to do it. And it, it's it's quite, it's not great. You know, you have to be so, have to, the amount of red tape, really. But it, it does protect the building. But it's, it's um, been a big part of the project. And how they reacted when you proposed them a new Jacobian ceiling? It can be well. They but they negotiated. Well, so they were they were the, our original planning officer wanted a very simple strap work um, ceiling, which looked very odd and out of keeping. And it was only with kind of you know we then negotiated up to what Philip finally produced. But that, that was a journey, and you know there were lots of different aspects that took time. But that again, that was just one of them that the planning officer picked up on and didn't want initially. But actually, you know, he then left. And a new planning officer came in and they were slightly more reactive. So, you know, for the passage of time, 
you know, and that maybe took three years, but we've got the clients got what they wanted at the end. So it's um extraordinary. I did a unique project in that sense. Can I say something about that yeah, as well? Absolutely. Um, because those kind of commissions are really important. I'm, I'm sure Ben will agree that not only from a point of view of us creating something really lovely, but um, from the amount of people that got involved in terms of training. So I think yeah. from the solar ceiling alone, we probably had 20 people come through looking for experience. There were the SPAB fellows and scholars and Princess Foundation students and and lots of other people who just get in touch with us on social media and say, can we come and spend a day with you? Because um, we really want to know how to do that. Um, so it's really important that we get those those kinds of commissions to carry on with our, our sort of educational programme. Yeah, Sorry, that absolutely. <laughs> That's vital. Anyone, any questions, please? I'd be very happy to say thank you very much for an incredibly um, inspiring lecture. It's been so fun to see, and I watched some of these this project over, I think, Instagram for a while as well, and seen photos. And I've often had to like stop and zoom in on joinery details and plastering details because working with sort of similar country houses myself as well, it's so good to see other people doing similar and, and and very impressive work and to sort of see all these traditions being kept alive um and developed and all the young people and and craftsmen that work on this and help sort of do do plaster work joinery roof tiling there's i'm sure you could have spoken for a solid week <laughs> or spent a whole lecture on each single room yeah. with the amount of work and craft that goes into every single nail and screw and bit of ironmongery and so much so I can see that both the architects and the craftsmen have had a lot of fun um, just by looking at the, the level of details that are here and of course um, a very lucky client with also very good intentions and and money to carry through the vision but well, also lucky building as well you know the building has been unloved for a long time and you know it's, they've kind of you know saved it for the next hundred years really you know they've, they've invested heavily in it and it's it's now you know hopefully a good standing no thank you so much for that well said nicola do you have a question um Yes, it was absolutely wonderful to see. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask, because um, it, it obviously has a, a really extensive and, and really beautiful use of lime finishes on the, the render on the surface. And yeah. looking at your historic photos, clearly that's based on evidence. You know, it is clear exactly. that, that was the case. Did you have any um, pushback from any quarter on that? Because... I do. I mean, I, I live a couple of miles down the road from here and and obviously in the Cotswolds, it's so synonymous now with 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 stone being exposed where it 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 almost invariably wasn't intended to be. So I'd, I'd love to know your your kind of yep. experiences with that. So I, I was very lucky that I had Rory batting for me. So Rory Young. So when we initially were proposing this, the council were actually quite negative and didn't really want us to implement this. And because I think they had a lack of knowledge, they were quite inexperienced, they didn't really know a lot. So luckily I had Rory with me, um, and I, you know, I was probably only 25 at the time, and he did this amazing um, hour presentation for, um, showing the benefits of lime mortar, lime render, and lime washes, and it was utterly convincing, um, took them on the journey with them, and they said yes, and I did a listed building application copying what Rory had, was saying to me, and you know, there we go, and we got permission. But there was, it was, through using you know Rory helping me to, to do it um to be able to enable me to do it but they were hesitant and it was um you know his kind of enthusiasm and that knowledge that really took us through this um which was great was lucky. Uh, that's really, sorry if, if I may as well um was your was your client positive about this yes. and sort of really Absolutely. opened they, they weren't looking for that sort of cliched Oh, I'm in the Cotswolds. Well, ergo, no. I've got to have the stone. 
No, it was, we were looking at our reference images and our, you know, it was historically rendered, you know, and we were looking at, you know, benefits of that from the weathering perspective and trying to alleviate some of the damp problems. And the, the, this north range is damp because of the moat and, and you have um, kind of water, water ingress issues from that. So it's actually the render really helps the permeability of the walls and, and the kind of um, helping that damp issue. So it's, it's yeah, it was, yeah. Oh, it's, it's wonderful work. I hope I hope it, it's it's followed by others in the area. That would be a great thing to see. Yeah. Have you seen others following on that procedure after your it, project? I think Philip's involved in a few. I, I see on his Instagram him, him turning up some quite um, renowned, renowned country houses, looking at rendering and doing work for them. Yeah, there is there is one going on at Downton Abbey. Yeah, um, near Highgrove, that um, hopefully will come to fruition. I'm I'm sure it will. Oh, that's I I know that bit. That's an absolute stunner, is it? Because it's got a lot of the original finish left. It's it's breathtaking. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So I actually use that one of the reference images as part of the list of building application for for Ickham. So it's all quite yeah. awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Nopur, would you like to ask something? Yeah, hi um, everyone. I mean, it's an amazing project, and it was um, like um, um, it's 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 very amazing to listen to everyone and um, you know understanding like about the joinery. I mean, it was um, I can see, but I do have a question to George. Like, um, um, how did you treat it? Um, insulation and dampness. Um, so again, we were lucky that we had a well-resourced client who could take that holistic approach. So we did the best we can, could because we were restrained with the kind of aesthetics of, of the historic building. We couldn't, you know, raise the roof by 150 millimeters or put in a non-breathable material. So we actually, with, with um, the team on site, we, we did a lot of sample panels, we did a lot of research, and we worked out the, the kind of the best, most efficient materials that we could use that were breathable, that worked with the existing roof slopes and the uh, rafter depth. And it was a bit of kind of trial and error and experimentation, but we were lucky that our client had time. We had the amazing scaffolding around the building, so we could mock up different scenarios and kind of try and model and work out what would be the most effective. So we, we use a TLX Gold, which is a kind of a, a, a breather, it's a breathable insulation that gets draped over the, it's like a, a foil back insulation over the whole roof with um, sheep's wool in between the rafters and then um, uh, kind of wood wall board and then Philips blind plaster was our typical build up. But it was, you know, research time, sample panels, looking at exactly what would work in this specific scenario and just spending a bit of time and thought with, you know, with Tobias and Nick, our amazing architects as well, you know, collectively trying to work out a collaborative solution to that really and and any light uh, would you like to shed on on dampness like how you treat it and also budget i don't know like we we didn't discuss i know like budget is a difficult thing to um dis discuss um i don't know but, but do you uh, can you shed yeah. some light on that so just, we, we raked out all the cement mortars and put and used lime mortars everywhere so we use a non-hydraulic and we use hot lime so as well so which was you know um, we slaked our lime on site, um, found locally sourced aggregates, and, and Philip helped us develop that as well. And then, and then you know, used that everywhere. So we, we there was no cement anywhere in this building left. So that's really helped the moisture levels and to manage damp and to actually have you know active the building breathing um, throughout. Which is you know again another client and other projects wouldn't be able to do that holistically and very lucky building to have a client um willing to you know, take that yeah, approach. It's, it's difficult to find clients like this who have such uh, so much of patience for to you know work on a project for a decade yeah i don't know well it, it's it's quite when i work on my other projects it's always a little bit disappointing the clients always are not you know to have that you know enthusiasm and passion which is anyway yeah it's rare that you get uh you get a site where you often see the well every day the clients walking around after they finish yeah. work, getting involved in moving light positions and being really really hands on with all the decisions. Like it's that's been, yeah, it's been really nice working working for these guys. But it's a collaborative. But we're a team. You know, it's 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 not just us. There's loads, there's, there's lots of us. So it's it's having that attitude of. Um... Well, um, thank you so much for the explanation for this and. Um... It's it's um and congratulations for this project and um um also I mean any any thoughts on the budget like what sort of like I know it's it's 
But okay. any any idea can you could give for this? I, I can't I can't say numbers, but it, it, it lots. You know, you could you could it's 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 um you know it never makes sense financially to invest in these buildings, and it's all about like, people's passion. And um, you know, luckily that their clients very passionate. So you know, there you go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, George. Yeah. Very interesting. I think from what you say you can deliver another talk just on um, the works to make this building much more sustainable and thermally efficient. Yeah, yeah. And it's amazing that you took all the services out of the building. Yeah. So you didn't damage the fabric of the building practically. So the client was very precious of the building and didn't want to, you know, go through, you know, so they dictated everything. So we, that's why we built this uh, this new build cellar alongside the house, which enabled us to move all of the services to outside of the building fabric and then be very pre precise about where we did put services back in. So try and minimize any kind of invasiveness to the building. And that was, you know, was key. But again, that, you know, disproportionately cost a lot of money. And another project, your client wouldn't do that because it was, um, you know, it wouldn't have as much resources or time to, to do that and the, 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 this project the client was very you know insistent that they want that's the way they wanted to do it which you know it's what it is really be great <laughs> if you can publish it somewhere as a good example there you go yeah yeah good practice any other questions please If there aren't any questions, we can probably wrap it up. And oh no, there is a question. Ada, please unmute. Ada, if you want to ask the question, please unmute yourself and ask it. Now I think you can talk. Ada Tam? Okay, I think that's probably. Yes, she has the um, hands yeah. up, but she's not asking. Okay. So if you don't want to ask any other questions, we will wrap it up and we will thank, first of all, George and the other members of the team for such an amazing presentation. It's absolutely fantastic. And uh, that's the best example ever that the craftsmen are still here and it's our duty to keep them alive and um, having uh, those opportunities of teaching their apprentices the crafts. And I hope more projects like this take, can take place and more, most of us to be approved because sometimes there are problems with SPAB or Heritage England which don't consider that you have to intervene so much on a building unless there are very clear proofs that there have been some existing features. Apparently, Ada has a question. What sort of heating in the building is to suit the timber paneling? So we have um, a district-wide heating system and we actually blended the heating down because the radiator, it's, because the radiator's got too hot at about 70 degrees. And we didn't want that 70 degrees near the paneling. So we, we put blending valves in by the radiators um, on individual manifolds to reduce the heating down to about 50 or 40 degrees. So it meant that there was more even low temperature near the paneling. Because again, we were very concerned about warping or move the paneling moving over time once it was installed. So yeah, everything was sourced about, you know, every nth detail, Clients are very techy and, and um, you know, there's a, a huge control system and it's, it's, it's very, um, the level of detail is, goes from Ben's nail, you know, throughout, you know, that's kind of one, one example of everything, you know, things throughout the building. And it, it, the level of detail is incredible on this project. I see. And did you have to innovate other solutions just to fit the project apart from those with nails and... Uh, lots, Georgia, but I, I, I can't, you know. I, uh, I see. Maybe we will do a second talk yeah. just with the services because services are a very sensitive thing on project like this, and most of the architects don't know how to fit them yeah. without it's destroying been, the fabric of the building. It's been a massive learning curve for me. It's been, you know, there's a huge amount of services in the building, and you know, Philip set out his amazing solar system from the air conditioning. You know, and that, that's something we didn't talk about. Is you know that took a a big, that was a big project, putting air conditioning for it, wasn't it, in, in, in doing all that. 
Yes, maybe later you can prepare yes. another one on services. Yeah. So thank you everybody very much. And I would like to announce that our next event, it's actually in person, will be an afternoon of conferences and panel discussion held on Art Workers Guild on the 12th of April. And that will be followed by drink party. Uh, the conference part of the section, it's practically part of an international event called TAC 24, initiated by Dr. Nir Buras and the Classic Planning Institute. We will publish more details about this and uh, we will send the invites because this will be an internal invite, but of course all the TAC members and all our esteemed partners will be invited. I hope to see you all there and thank you again for this wonderful presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you for having us.